Fewer things in the world evoke the notion of creation than the fires of the forge and the hammer that strikes the anvil. But you've learned through devotion to turn these things towards both creation and destruction. Let's talk about the forge domain cleric. What is up, everybody? I am Eric from the Geek Pantheon, and we're doing another subclass deep dive. This one's from Xanathar's Guide to Everything, the Forge Domain Cleric, which is a really cool, flavorful uh, domain, I feel like. I really like it personally, and I think that it is a subclass that the abilities that they get and the spells that they get are very evocative of what they're trying to accomplish through the narrative with the subclass. So we're going to get into it with the spells and the class features, then we're going to talk about actually playing the thing. So let's get started. Okay, at first level with your spells, you get Identify and Searing Smite. Both of these make very much a whole lot of sense when it comes to the flavor of the class. Identify, you know, it, it has a bit of a barrier with the uh, pearl, the 100 gold piece pearl that you have to have. It's not consumed though when you cast it. So once you get that thing, then you're good to go. But, uh, you know, it, it makes sense that a Forged Domain Cleric would be able to identify the properties of magical items because that's what they do. They create magical stuff all the time. And then additionally, Searing Smite, you know, you're, you're imbuing f the fires of the Forge with your attacks and dealing additional damage when you cast it as a bonus action, which is great. And it leads into some other class features down the road to where you can really pile on the damage. If you also did like a dip into Rogue to get sneak attack damage on it, then you could really, boom. But yeah, uh, just starting out at level one, this is a good little damage spike that you can throw on to turns to be able to bump up your, your damage a little bit. And it makes flavorful sense because the fires of the forge power your attacks. Then additionally at first level, you get bonus proficiencies with Smith tools and heavy armor. Once again, nothing really to speak about here. To just, yeah, why wouldn't you get these things as a forge domain cleric? heavy armor and smith's tools. They they fit perfectly into the flavor of the subclass. And then additionally you get Blessing of the Forge, which at first level you gain the ability to imbue magic into a weapon or a piece of armor. So once per long rest, essentially when you finish a long rest, you get to pick a weapon or a piece of armor and turn it magically. You get a plus one to your AC or plus one bonus to attack and damage rolls with the weapon. Uh, and you can do it once per long rest. This is huge because I. I know that there's some debate over it. I am falling firmly into the camp of if, if a weapon is stated as being a magical weapon, then it deals magical damage. And so it overcomes the resistance bits uh, against non-magical. Like if something has resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage from non-magical weapons, this would overcome that resistance because it is a magical weapon. I know that there are some people that say it doesn't say it deals magical damage. I'm not in that camp. I, th this would overcome those resistances. A, at first level, how many things are you encountering that have that resistance to begin with? And B, just, just, yeah, just, it's, I'm not gonna debate it here. I think it makes sense. So getting that at first level is a huge deal and is something that can really carry you through, especially once you start hitting that like teetering from the initial tier into the mid tier of the game and you start encountering more things with that resistance. Just having a locked and loaded way that you can overcome that without needing to worry about getting loot is really cool. And before we continue, if you want to be part of the conversation surrounding this episode, we have a Discord down below that you can click on the link to and go join us over there. We have lots of channels where you can discuss these videos or just playing in general or find a group that you want to play with. We also have a channel for that. Uh, and we also have a Patreon, patreon.com slash the Geek Pantheon if you want to support the channel and my endeavors to create these videos. That would be wonderful of you. I would greatly appreciate it. And you can do so at patreon.com slash the Geek Pantheon. At second level, you get your channel divinity, which this is an interesting channel divinity. It's Artisan's Blessing. You conduct an hour long ritual to create a non-magical item that contains at least some metal. And they list some different options, but basically you have to lay out metal, including coins equal to the value of how much it would cost to create the thing. So you're essentially eliminating the labor factor, not the cost factor of creating something. But what's really cool is it talks about being able to duplicate items, including like a key if you have the original. So your party could go steal a key to a safe or a vault or whatever and bring it back to their hideout, have the cleric perform an hour long ritual, duplicate the key, then take the key back before the sun rises and people notice that it's gone. 
put it back, nobody realizes that you now have a copy of a key to this thing. That'd be a really great use of this. That's super cool. But just in general, I think this is an interesting, like you're using a ritual to call upon your God to manifest a non-magical item worth less than a hundred gold pieces. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that this is a great channel divinity. I think it's, I think it's interesting. I think flavorfully it works really well. And there's a lot of utility uses to an ability like this that I, I don't think it should be discarded out of hand as being like, oh, it's not a combat thing, so it's not as cool. This can be really cool for certain campaigns. At third level, you get heat metal, which, duh, like I'd be mad if you didn't get that spell uh, on this spell list. But yeah, the heat metal spell works perfectly with this domain. And additionally, the magic weapon spell. So this is as a bonus action, it's a concentration spell for one hour that you, much like your first level ability, can make a magic, a non-magic weapon a magic weapon. So I like this because you can now start double dipping. With your first level ability, you can make your armor magical and then cast a spell to make your weapon magical for an hour. Uh, or you could just benefit a party member, make their weapon magical for an hour. And so you get a little bit more utility out of it since your first level ability, it's, it's one and done per long rest. So yeah, I, I really like this. I think it's thematically fits. And I think that you can get a lot of really interesting utility, especially pairing with your first level ability. Then at fifth level, you get two more spells. One is protection from energy, where you get to pick one of the elemental damage types, acid, cold, fire, so on and so forth. And you gain resistance to that. Uh, you should obviously be picking fire. I mean, if you're just, if you're playing it for the thematic nature of it, then you can only pick fire, but I understand why they're not going to put that limitation on the spell. But, you know, look at the color scheme behind me. It's, it's all fire, all day, all fire. So, and then additionally, elemental weapon, you can turn yet another non-magical weapon into a magical weapon. Now, granted, both this and magic weapon are concentration, so you can't do both at the same time. This is just kind of an upgrade to magic weapon. But then you can also, once again, pick an elemental damage type, acid, cold, fire, so on and so forth. And you deal an additional 1d4 of that type of damage on this attack. Now, one important thing to note is you can't like do elemental weapon and then searing smite and stack that damage because they're both concentration spells. Boo. But <laughs> from a balance standpoint, yes, it makes sense. So actually searing smite, you only get it on one attack. So it's like, whereas elemental weapon, you get it on every attack for an hour. So you get more damage with Searing Smite, but you get more consistent damage with elemental weapon. So, you know, pick your poison. And obviously elemental weapon doesn't have the ongoing damage that Searing Smite does. You know, they're, they're two very different things. Six level, Soul of the Forge, you gain resistance to fire damage. And when you're wearing heavy armor, you get a plus one to AC. So you're even harder to hit. This is just, you know, evoking, you, you've spent so much time in the forge. <laughs> you've spent so much time making armor, making weapons, being around the intense heat of the fires of the forge that they, you're no longer as affected to heat as other people would be. And you're so good at crafting and tweaking heavy armor. That's how I would flavor it is like, you've learned the craft of creating heavy armor so well that you're able to modify your heavy armor to just fit perfectly. It just, it's, it fits so well that you're that much harder to hit. You've closed the creases. You're still agile while wearing it, like whatever flavor you want to tack onto it. But that's, that's in my head, what Soul of the Forge means from a narrative standpoint. Seventh level, you get Fabricate as a spell, which yeah, this, this builds off of Artisan's Blessing so well. This, the Fabricate spell is such a great narrative progression. Like I, I've been able to create little things that contain a bit of metal. And now all of a sudden I see those trees that fell over. Now they're a bridge. Uh, so yeah, once again, the narrative through line of this makes a lot of sense. And then wall of fire, you can just summon the fires of the forge and a giant wall to keep your enemies out or keep your enemies in or, or whatever you want to do. So yeah, very uh, wall of fire. All the wall spells are great. Wall of Fire makes perfect sense with the Forge Domain Cleric. It's a very, I think it's a really great spell. Divine Strike, uh, basically you're able to infuse your attacks with more Fires of the Forge. So once per turn, when you hit with an attack, you can add an additional 1d8 fire damage to that attack. When you hit level 14, it bumps up to 2d8. Important thing though, this does not take any form of action economy. It does not take a reaction, does not take a bonus action. It's just a thing you can look to do. So this can stack with elemental weapon or searing smite. Uh, you know, if, if you're really trying to get a spike of damage, then you could cast searing smite with your bonus action, hit, and then 
once you've hit, make the decision to then tack on your additional D8s of fire damage on top and really just bam. Okay, ninth level, you get two spells, animate objects, which, yeah, this, yeah, you, you can make the suits of armor dance for you. You imbue them with the, ma the magic of your god uh, to then animate and take life. It's great, flavorful, makes perfect sense. You also get creation as a spell. Creation is a great spell. I, I I would not fear it in the hands of any of my players personally, but I have seen some videos about how the creation spell can get very cheesy. So if if you're somebody that is very concerned about balance and you play with a lot of people that you maybe know are going to try to break the game, then maybe watch go go do a little googling, search it on the YouTube's for uh, creation spell shenanigans, and see it's. Primarily the five cubic feet rule, like making rope that exists within five cubic feet, you can make a lot of rope in that space, and then just the the shenanigans go from there. So just keep that in mind when you're looking at somebody that's taking the Forge Domain Cleric and they're hitting ninth level and getting the creation spell, you might be due for some, some wackiness at your table, which some people enjoy, but it's worth mentioning. And then Saint of Forge and Fire. At 17th level, you gain immunity to fire damage and resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical attacks. Which at 17th level, you know, it, it, it depends on what you're going up against. Because like the Tarrasque, you, you have resistance to all the damage from the Tarrasque, which pretty great, because <laughs> the Tarrasque doesn't deal magical damage. But if you're going up against like Death Knights and like stuff with cool magic items then it's it's less impactful but immunity to fire damage is huge you just walk through lava because you are one with the fires of the forge so yeah this is a great capstone it really is evocative of the flavor uh you know you're not you've gotten a lot of really cool spells you're also a cleric so you're getting all the other cleric spells so you can do a lot of cool stuff i know that some people might look at like the capstone ability of a domain and see immunity to fire damage and resistance to non-magical attacks from you know and be let down by that, especially compared with something like the life domain cleric, where like when you're rolling dice to restore hit points, you just use the maximum amount. Like you don't roll 2d6, it's just, oh, it's 12. So, you know, I could see how something like that would seem more impactful, but I think narratively it makes a lot of sense. And depending on your game, immunity to fire damage is good. It's a lot. I mean, wall of fire, you, you now can throw that up and have no regard for where you put it in terms of your own like well-being. Uh, or if you have like sorcerers or wizards that are flinging around fire spells, you can just be in the fray amongst the fireballs and and all and meteor storms and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I, I I think it works really well. And I think very few people play at level 17 anyway. I know I've started saying that a lot, but it's true. Just so in theory, uh, this would be a really great thing. And if you've actually gotten on the table and used it, I, I think that this would allow you a lot of freedom around the battlefield, not having to be afraid of fire damage. So I think when it comes to playing this subclass, it, this is one of the easier ones to discuss in this regard because you, you're a blacksmith. You are a child of the forge. Um, and I, I think that, you know, from a narrative standpoint, you just lean into that. You lean into being a blacksmith. You wield a war hammer. Like if you use a shield, it's like an anvil. <laughs> like you just, you lean so far into the blacksmith tropiness of it uh, that, that it's, it's wonderful and delightful. And uh, you obviously don't have to use a war hammer. Uh, you, you could use a bigger hammer. Um, but I, I think that the more you lean into the forge iconography and the flavor of it, the more fun you're going to have with it. Uh, because th this is something that you could completely remove. Like you could wield a sword and a shield and just be a cleric of the God of Smiths. And you could be a blacksmith, but you still wield a sword and that's fun. But if you just lean way into it and, you know, you wear your blacksmith apron over your heavy armor and you just, you look like a blacksmith that's wearing plate, <laughs> like that's, that's so fun. And that's so evocative of what the subclass is going for and crying out to the fires of the forge every time you're doing searing smite and things like that just leaning way into it and to build off of that type of games and parties that this subclass would work well in i think this is one you can slide into a lot of different campaigns and party compositions and it works because if you're playing in a fantasy setting blacksmiths are flipping everywhere like like they they have to be 
in order to make the swords that, that adventurers use to kill the kobolds. Um, but I think that if where I would love to see this subclass truly shine is a campaign where at level one, the party are all just like mundane, like they just have jobs. And this character is a blacksmith in the town. And maybe like the gods take notice of the town and like it's like a Power Rangers thing where like these five individuals have been imbued with great power. Um, or Captain Planet or pick pick your poison from the 80s, 90s television era. Uh, but I, I think that that type of game would be really fun of like this mundane blacksmith that all of a sudden can like their hammer like is imbued with the fires of the forge and they can attack and deal additional damage. And then at second level, they can just like create stuff. Like if they just lay, leave metal out, like that's how I would have like the discovery of that channel of Div divinity ability is they leave some raw material just out near their forge and they come back and the thing is there. And it's like, what? I did. Did you do this? I didn't do this. Who did this? Who made this sword? Uh, me? Oh, wait, what? Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that that type of character, the mundane everyman that is confused by the onset of their powers would be a joy to watch and or play. And additionally, uh, DMing for this subclass, um, you know, throw stuff that's vulnerable to fire at them. Um, throw lots of light. Yeah, throw things that the fire is going to have an impact and throw things that, uh, in conversely, once they start getting resistance to fire damage and immunity to fire damage, get things that are going to fling fire around a lot so that they can really feel the joy of their ability. Also, having a game where there's plenty of downtime for them to craft things, to, for them to really play into the blacksmith side of their character is a great idea. I think it, it would go a long way towards making this character feel useful and special. And yeah, I, I think that that's, that's really the crux of it is plenty of downtime for them to, to be a blacksmith and, you know, keeping fire damage in mind, whether it's them dealing it or them having to deal with it. I think that both of those things are very important when it comes to running for this subclass. So let me know what you thought down below. Do you like this subclass? Do you think it's compelling? Would you like to play one? Uh, did I get something wrong? <laughs> let me know down below. Did I completely beef something when I was giving like rules interpretations? Do you disagree that just because something is a magical weapon doesn't mean it deals magical damage? Let me know down below and I'll roll my eyes at you because that's what I do. But anyway, thank you all so much for watching. I've been Eric and I will see you next time.